Welcome to another segment of Sage Advice, where I talk to Jeremy Crawford. Hi, Jeremy. Hi. Good about, to see you. Good to see you, too. Uh, we talk about fun rules topics within Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition for you to uh, learn more about the aspects of how to use them in the game, but also some design philosophy about why the decisions were made as we are making them. And, Jeremy, you've been working a lot on Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, and there are a lot of fun mechanics within that beyond the subclasses and uh, puzzle guidance for Dungeon Masters uh, and amongst the myriad of other things that are in that book. Uh, there are some really fun mechanics in there, and one of the ones we wanted to go over today in this segment was group patrons. And that one, uh, that mechanic came first to uh, the public's view in the Eberron book, right? Rising from the Last Absolutely. War? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Originally, we explored this concept of a group patron for Eberron rising from the last war because we wanted to create really two things. First, we wanted to give you an ability specifically in Eberron to connect your group of characters to one of that world's amazing organizations, because a big part of Eberron is you have the dragon marked houses and you have these various nations all embroiled in you know, different political machinations and plots. And we wanted to give you a concrete way of being connected to one of those groups or individuals uh, when you embarked on an Eberron campaign. But we also had a broader design goal, and that was to give you a simple way as a group of characters to pick something that would immediately unify you, not only as an adventuring group, but also uh, unify your story. Uh, every group has had that moment in the character creation process where each individual has come up with their cool character, with their fascinating backstory, and then everyone has to pause and wonder, wait, how do these characters actually tie together? What brought this disparate group together? And usually D&D groups are wanting something a bit more meaty than we ran into each other in a tavern. Although that, of course, is a great old standby. Uh, Always a good fallback, for sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's nothing wrong with we were all sitting around having drinks. We started talking and realized, you know, you want treasure. I want treasure. Let's go get treasure. And that's sort of that's sort of a D and D classic. But many groups want a bit more narrative meat on on those bones. And some groups are great at coming up with a narrative on their own for their group. But sometimes it can be a struggle. It could be you're playing with uh, people you don't play with normally. Or maybe you're playing with your long-standing D&D group, but the group of characters you came up with are so disparate in their backstories that you might struggle to come up with why the heck are, are we working together? Right. Well, the group patron system is one way you can very simply answer the question of why are we working together? Because as soon as you all decide, hey, we're employees of this university, or we all work for this particular duchess, your group gets pulled together. You suddenly have common purpose. You suddenly have a quest giver or a whole host of quest givers. You can have then missions that can shape the whole course of your campaign, depending on how deeply a dungeon master wants to engage with your patron as a part of the broader story it suddenly unlocks this toolkit uh, for storytelling, for how you see your character developing, NPCs you might meet, you know, personal goals that the, the characters might develop in relation to their group patron. People responded positively enough to this concept in Eberron that we thought, what if we did this but did it for all D&D worlds. Right. Take that very Eberron-specific approach that we had in the Eberron book and generalize it. Make it so that we would have a set of group patrons that if you're playing in Greyhawk, the Forgotten Realms, Spelljammer, a world of your own creation, you could go to this set of group patrons and find something that would be appropriate for you. 
So with that goal in mind, we created the group patron chapter of Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. And we indeed created a set of, of patrons riffing on some of the work we did in the Eberron book that are truly setting agnostic. How does having, I mean, because group patrons have been something that people have used uh, in Dungeons and Dragons for, for many, many years, right? I mean, you could even say, you know, any type of situation in which you're getting missions from a, from a king or a wizard or, or any of those things could fall under, under the auspices of that name. Um, but what sets this apart? What mechanically do uh, players and dungeon masters do differently when they, have, uh, when they interact with this system? One of the big things is first, we have formalized it uh, because often when people have done it in the past, it's been informal. Here, if you engage with the group patron system, you're asked to think very consciously, do we want to engage with this right from the get-go? Uh, then we also give you concrete perks that your group can acquire through your work with your group patron. And these perks can include hard cash. You know, there's some of the group patrons uh, in, in uh, Tasha's Cauldron, you know, they're going to pay you for the work that you do. But there are even some of them that will give you things like supernatural gifts. So your, your group might actually gain new powers as a result of the work that you're doing for this patron. All of that, of course, a DM could improvise, but here we've done the work for you by saying, hey, if your group patron is an ancient being, for example, the ancient being is one of the, the uh, examples in Tasha's Cauldron, as a result of that work, you might eventually get supernatural abilities that have been bestowed upon you by this patron whose motivations may or may not be entirely known to you uh, or might be suspect. I say that because one of the example ancient beings we give in Tasha's Cauldron is the Lich Azalin from uh, Ravenloft. Mm -hmm. uh, Azalin is a rival of Strahd's. And in the book, in the ancient being section, there is a, a painting of, of Azalin peering into a crystal ball at Castle Ravenloft. So, if you have a, a patron like that, uh, who knows what strange errands they're going to send your group on. Now, in Tasha's Cauldron, we also introduce another mechanical goodie for groups that engage with a group patron. And this is something that was not in the Eberron book. Oh, okay. That is, that is, if your group has a group patron, because of the extra cohesiveness that that represents, whether you're all employees of a particular organization, like a, a criminal syndicate, you know, which is one of the options, or a military or a religious order. Because of that extra cohes cohesiveness among your characters, you all now have the ability to, each of you, once per day, grant advantage to one of your fellow party members uh, to any ability score, uh, rather ability check, attack roll, or saving throw that the other person makes, as long as uh, you can see or hear each other. And really what this is, it's the ability to kind of instantly take the help action once per day to help someone else in this tight-knit group, representing how much more closely you are all accustomed to work together because of the connections that the group patron represents. Uh, for instance, if you take uh, the, the military group patron, uh, there is a good chance that your group might have served together you know, on, on a battlefield uh, or on many battlefields. And as a result of that time served and the training that you've experienced together, it's more easy for you to help each other try to accomplish various things than a typical D and D group. That's another really cool. way of say, and another way of saying all of this is really it's just you each have the ability to give each other inspiration. Uh, you know, because that's that's essentially what the inspiration mechanic is, which is you know giving a buddy uh, advantage on on one of these D twenty rolls. I love that. I mean, it's something that I I do at the table a lot is to to try to encourage the uh, rule as written for inspiration, which says that you can 
bestow that inspiration on other characters. It's not just a DM to character pipeline. It's supposed to be something that's spread around and used when necessary. And this is just reinforcing that idea. Definitely. And even go so far as not allowing you to give it to yourself. With this group patron ability, you can only give this advantage to other people. I like that. Uh, uh, and so maybe, you know, you help them and eventually they'll use theirs uh, to help you. Uh, this will be, it will be interesting to see people use it in play because resources like this are always tricky in D&D &D and, and, and actually in many tabletop games because you'll always have those players who want to hold on to it for just the right moment and then you get to the end of the session and realize they never <laughs> used it. So I'm, I'm hoping people will be bold and and use it uh, to to you know get get their companions out of trouble uh, as often as possible, hmm. knowing you're going to get it back when you complete your next long rest. I am firmly in that camp of playing computer RPGs, who at the end of the game has like 500 potions and 600 <laughs> scrolls that I'm like, I'm saving it for the final boss. Oh, that was the boss. Oh, okay. I guess I didn't need to use them anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I, I hear you. I for for some reason I'm pretty good about using consumables in in the games I play, except for potions. For some reason, I too will get to the end. And it's like I don't know how my character is carrying these hundreds of potions, <laughs> <laughs> but there they are. You're wearing a cloak of potions. <laughs> That's right. That's awesome. Uh, I also like this because it reminds me of uh, I don't know what the feature was called, but there was a 3.5 feature that was similar to this that was all about your group working together cohesively. And you had, I mean, there were some persnickety rules of like you couldn't fire into melee. And so some ways uh, this benefit allowed you to do that, essentially. Uh, I remember in 3.5. Um, but this is getting that idea that like you're a, you're a, a trained group that is doing something together, which has a lot of tropes in, in fantasy and uh, speculative fiction. Like, you know, I'm thinking of like Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. or like even X-Men mm -hmm. or like all these like superhero groups that work together and they work together so well because they've trained on each other's abilities and weaknesses. And this is exactly the type of thing that you would expect a well-honed D&D party to do. It, absolutely. And that, that was exactly the inspiration behind this. We had in mind, you know, like, how are the X-Men, you know, when they fight together or, you know, the Fellowship of the Ring, you know, it's a well-oiled machine, which all D&D &D groups achieve that at some point, you know, and, and when a group plays together long enough, you know, there's this beauty as, as people start understanding what each other's characters can do and you start setting each other up, you know, like, okay, I'm going to do this. And because I did this, you're going to now be even more effective. But with this group patron rule, it's going to make it even easier. It's kind of, you know, uh, greasing the wheels of that process of, of your group working truly as a team. We also uh, give guidance uh, in Tasha's Cauldron for being your own patron, because you might want to decide that you're running an organization. And there are risks, of course, involved in that because you are now taking on the responsibilities of running an organization. You also don't have the benefit of someone else paying you, uh, but that option is there uh, as well. Uh, I think people are going to mostly, though, gravitate toward the patrons themselves uh, because we have, I think, a really nice spread of different options. You know, I've mentioned the military force, the ancient being, re religious order, uh, an academic institution. Uh, there's also the guild if you want to work for, you know, maybe a merchant empire or a particular guild, like a, a thieves guild, uh, you know, criminal organization. Uh, you can uh, work for uh, an aristocrat or a sovereign. Like if you want to, your patron to be like a king or a queen, uh, that is also an option. And e each one of those options can flavor a campaign in a radical way. I mean, if you imagine, imagine two groups, for instance, diving into Rhyme of the Frost Maiden, but one group is going in in service to a religious order, and the other group is going in as part of a military. Just that difference could change completely 
how their playthrough of those adventures feels, depending again on how much the DM decides to incorporate that group patron element into the campaign. It almost feels uh, like this should be introduced and talked about at like a session zero or before you really start play, right? Like at the character creation stage. Absolutely. And that is the intention. And in, I, I love that you mentioned session zero because we actually have a whole section in Tasha's Cauldron okay. on running a session zero. And we recommend in the book, when you have a session zero, consider uh, taking on a group patron for your group. Uh, session zero is one of those things that the tabletop RPG community has talked about for many, many years. And even D&D products over the decades have talked about it. But we realized none of our fifth edition rule books have really forefronted it as something uh, to consider for your campaign. And so we do that in Tasha's Cauldron. Now, I'm, I'm running a campaign right now that it's a, it's a, it's a, a homebrew setting. And I'm thinking about adapting this group patron idea for use within it because uh, it fits really well. Uh, but I sold that kind of idea to my players in the session zero Meaning like, oh, do you guys want someone to to be like the quest giver early on uh, so that you have some guidance and some some direction? Feel free to, you can, you know, not do what they ask you to do whenever you want. Um, but how, how would you use this feature and then allow players to abandon it if they wanted to? Uh, I, abandoning it, I think, is an exciting... Uh, option for every group. And I say exciting because saying no to your patron can generate as much adventure potentially as saying yes. Mm. Uh, Because if you get on your patron's bad side or simply they stop being your patron, you might go from having a friendly quest giver to having a new rival or even a new enemy. And so even that turns into a powerful storytelling tool for the dungeon master. And, you know, the, the patron isn't going to take a group messing up or, or refusing their requests forever. And again, I think that that is a very uh, fun path potentially for a group to explore. Because like going back to that ancient being example I used earlier, you might be okay early on serving Azalin the Lich. You might not even realize you are serving that Lich. But maybe once you do figure it out and you figure out what that patron's goals are, you might decide to walk. You you might decide, we need to go find ourselves a new group patron or just be done with this patron business. And and that is a part of the flexibility of this system. Would you uh, take away any of the features that they had earned through their patron? I mean, I guess a supernatural gift is something that, okay, you're you're no longer bestowed with that blessing. But like, it's not like you can make people forget their training. (laughs) <laughs> right, right. And 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 so yeah, the benefits in the book, they're clear about, you know, how long you retain them and that kind of thing. Oh, that's great. Uh, and 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 also, you know, especially when it comes to cold hard cash, uh, the patron can't take it back uh unless well, they might try. <laughs> <laughs> but but the group might have something to say about that. Oh man, then it becomes not a heist adventure, it becomes a defend the heist adventure. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That exactly. could be super fun. Uh, so uh, yeah, how how would you say that you are already in the middle middle of a campaign and you as a dungeon master really want to introduce uh, one of these group patrons uh, from Tasha's or you want to retrofit something that's already been happening in your campaign to this? Uh, what advice would you give for for integrating into an ongoing story? So these actually work perfectly as a later addition because people constantly meet new NPCs, new organizations over the course of a campaign. Imagine a group, for instance, traveling to a nation they haven't been before. They meet the sovereign there, and they are suddenly asked to do various things in the kingdom because of what the sovereign has heard they've accomplished in other parts of the world. At that moment, that sovereign could become that group's patron, and then that group gains access to, you know, the different different perks of having that 
that NPC as their patron, and they have the potential to you know, work their way up in their patron's good graces. So this can be something that you add later in a campaign. And we also have guidance in each group patron on the types of roles that each character might play as part of that particular organization or in service to an individual like a king or a queen. What we do in each group patron is we have a table that lists a variety of the backgrounds in the player's handbook and then associates those backgrounds with different jobs you might have in that organization or in service to that individual. And so if whether you're making your character and and your group is selecting a patron or you are adopting a patron later in the campaign, you have a sort of a map in Tasha's Cauldron for how not only your group can interact with that patron, but how you as an individual might be working with that patron. That makes a lot of sense. Um, and I could totally see that being like, all right, we've finished this arc of, of a, you know, of getting this story resolved. We killed the dragon. That kingdom is fine. We're going to the next kingdom. And then that's when you introduce a group patron or, you know, maybe that's even the hook that brings people to a, uh, the, the party to a new area uh, is to work for this new, perhaps more powerful uh, patron out there to, to be able to do things. So that's a good tool to have in the Dungeon Master's toolbox to spice up an ongoing campaign. Absolutely. And and you you mentioning that is now making me imagine groups that are maybe constantly trying to trade up yeah. on their patrons. <laughs> we served a guild before, but now we can serve the queen herself. Right. We were we were working for a wizard, but now we got a, a mystical being we can work for. Let's let's do that. That seems yeah, to be yeah. good. Um yeah, and I I do love this feature because it does automatically make you think of you know how you would describe your campaign to someone like if you were if you were to do your log line of like oh we played in this campaign where we were working for uh you know the 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 king of some land then that's an easily oh identifiable identifiable story hook that that you could share with everybody and absolutely yeah i like that a lot um, I'm, I'm thinking about doing that with Icewind Dale when I start playing with my girls. I'm like, maybe they'll be, because they love, they're in school right now, maybe they will love working for a university or an educational uh, uh, thing to go catalog all of the, the flora and fauna and how it's happening uh, with what's happening in, in Icewind Dale. That could be really fun. Yeah, they, they also could have heard rumors in the university of something buried under the ice. And, you know, they... They go go to Icewind Dale on an archaeological expedition, uh, yeah. it, and it it is powerful how much a group patron, even married to an adventure like Rime of the Frost Maiden that has a full fledged story of its own, how powerfully the group patron can introduce a whole new layer of storytelling mm-hmm. and of really helping to answer not only the questions we brought up earlier in our talk about why is this group together, but also then the next question of why are we going on this adventure? Uh, Because that's also a question sometimes groups struggle with is, okay, we figured out why we're together, but now what's the connection between us and the plot of this adventure? The group patron can help answer that question too. Yeah. In a really elegant way that feels like, all right, well, you're going to do a task, right? And I'm thinking of, uh, that scene from Indiana Jones where the uh, government officials come in and basically give him his quest. Uh, you know, <laughs> essentially, he's working for a group patron in that situation. Yeah, and I, I love that scene in Raiders of the Lost Ark, uh, not only for that reason, because it, it's like he got his group patron, but then that also that scene has the style of exposition that many dungeon masters do, yes. you know, like, and now we're also going to tell you about the Ark of the Covenant. And like, you can just imagine that whole scene being the the work of a DM. Who knew that? Uh, well, I guess we did know that Spielberg was uh, a dungeon master from its uh, appear, uh, D&D's appearance in E.T. So there it is. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We figured it out here on Sage Advice. Uh, excellent. <laughs> well, I'm excited uh, for more players to interact with the group patron. As I said, a lot of people use this uh, and have been for, throughout. So having it formalized and being able to be introduced uh, to the D&D fandom is going to be really great. But I know that the first question that people will probably ask is, well, 
can I make new ones? Can, are there are there group patrons that aren't covered in this list? Uh, and and what guidelines you might give to someone who's going to create their own group patron? I think the group patrons in the book are a great template for for DMs and players to come up with new patrons because you'll see when you go through them that we have provided information in pretty consistent categories like types of perks, the sorts of rules you can have, the different types of missions you can go on, also coming up with who your contact is in the organization or whom, or the NPC who might be the go-between between, between uh, your, your group and a patron who's an individual. If you look at all of the parts that, that build a group patron, I think a DM and a group can very easily then graft on new details or, you know, again, come up with an entirely new patron. Yeah. And I could see that being something that's done uh, and published on Dungeon Masters Guild. Like here's a, mm-hmm. a list of, you know, fleshed out patrons that you can adapt uh, beyond the the templates that are in Tasha's. I'm sure we're going to see those very soon. Yeah, because because in many ways, uh, a group patron uh, is it's sort of like a background for your group and when it comes to homebrewing content or writing for the DMs Guild, I think it would be in terms of like the, the game mechanical lift of doing this design work, uh, it, that the weight of that is pretty low. And so I, I encourage people, you know, give it a try. Uh, you know, if you've, if you've tried your hand at making backgrounds, uh, give designing uh, patrons a go as well. Yeah. And Dungeon Masters, you know, no need to publish them. You can just do that on your own and and run it in your campaign. Absolutely. And I'm sure they will. That'd be really great. Cool. Any other kind of topics around group patrons that we wanted to make sure we got across here? Uh, let's see. One of the one of the more amusing bits, potentially, I think, is that little contact bit that I mentioned in passing. Because when you pick your patron you aren't just picking who that person or organization is. You're then also picking who do you talk to, who actually gives you your missions. Mm. And so for each group patron, we have a table of options. A DM, of course, can create additional options. But some some of those contact possibilities can themselves spawn adventures because some of the, the contact possibilities on the tables are are wacky, others are mysterious, a few are even scary. Uh, you know, because I mentioned, you know, some of these, some of these uh, patron options are supernatural. And that means some of the contact options are supernatural. Like oh, you, yeah. like what one of the options on one of the tables is you might get all of your missions in your dreams. Like that's how your your patron contacts you. Uh, which that alone will create a very different campaign experience than if your contact is someone in an office somewhere that you go meet and you know get get quests on on parchment. Uh, so so that it's another example of how each choice that you make as a part of the group patron can can generate adventure quests and and alter the feel of the overall story. Are there are there templated NPCs that you can use as these contacts, or are they more just like one sentence descriptions? They're just a few sentences of description, uh, but it would be fairly easy to marry them to NPC stat blocks in the NPC uh, appendix of the monster manual, or even sidekicks. And, yes, yeah, yeah. You could easily build them as sidekicks. Also using rules from Tasha's Cauldron. Yes, which we will talk about on a future segment of Sage Advice. Um, and uh, just one final thing I wanted to, to throw out there with your mentioning earlier about having the group be their own patron, um, it immediately sprang to mind the idea uh, combined with you know who the contact is, is if you're running um, multiple campaigns in, the, in a shared universe type thing or if you, if you retire your group uh, at high level and start playing with low level characters, uh, you as a dungeon master can do that wonderfully fun thing, which is use the uh, high level characters from your player's past as contacts in an organization going forward. I love that idea. Yeah. Yes, DMs, listen to him, do it. 
<laughs> and as always, I'm inspired to like run like every single campaign uh, <laughs> that I could possibly have the time for <laughs> after talking to you. So thank you, Jeremy. Um, where can people get in touch with you and potentially ask you questions about uh, Dungeons and Dragons, but group patrons and what's in Tasha's? Uh, best place to reach me is on Twitter, where I am Jeremy E. Crawford. I don't, I don't get onto Twitter as much as I used to, uh, but I love seeing people's questions and comments when I do go there, because uh, even if I don't have time to answer them, uh, they, they go into my, my bank and you know, I ponder you know, what people are interested in, you know, what's puzzling people, and that, that feeds into the work that then the team does. Yeah, and potentially uh, has topics arise that we might want to talk about here on Dragon Talk. So uh, definitely keep shooting in uh, those questions. We really appreciate it. Excellent. Well, thanks as always, Jeremy. Great to talk to you. And we'll be back with some more fun D&D segments next week. Great. Bye, everyone.